Yes. It's a very random question, but as you were talking about mindfulness to kind of calm the responses, I'm just wondering if that type of meditation has ever been used for violence prevention, because I do a lot of work of, in violence prevention of youth and at-risk youth, and I just was thinking that's something that I've never heard of people trying, so I'm just curious if you know of other groups that are using meditation and mindfulness for violence prevention. Well, I, I don't know of a study of mindfulness being used for violence prevention, although I was recently at a conference out in Denver, in the first international conference on contemplative studies, where we, we, were, we were sort of looking at a graph of how many studies of mindfulness there were when I started out, you know, like one a year maybe, to today where there are hundreds and hundreds every year, and there's millions of dollars going into this. So I wouldn't be surprised. I haven't seen anything, and I have, you know... Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised. Now, I know that there are studies of using mindfulness and other practices like transcendental meditation in prisons. And so certainly I think there's a, there's a, a, you know, a strong, you know, and that's in India as well. There are a lot of Indian studies where it's used in prisons, Vipassana, for example. And there's Western studies where TM has been used in prison and mindfulness has been used in prison along with yoga in some cases. So, you know, definitely it's, it's, it's something that, that needs to be explored and, and make sense. Um, okay, any other questions, or should we talk a little bit about... I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you talked about the four wheels, and I guess you could talk at length about each of them. But I was particularly drawn to, I think you used the word leadership in the third wheel. Yes, Somehow good. Bringing... Well, thank you. Okay, so, so that's helping us move to the less familiar end of the spectrum here, which I think is, is, is good, even though we don't want, you know, we, you know, uh, we want everyone to, to be comfortable and you know, not, too, not too stressed. But, um, you know, eff effectively, if you look at it this way, you know, the basic, you know, Buddhist skills are really all about building peace and the capacity for peace and benevolence, okay? Kind of, you know, learning how to master the equipment of violence, the violent part of our nurses, and learning, if you look at, say, Dan Siegel's work, the, the prefrontal cortex, the, the discovery of the uniquely human part of the brain I call the extra scoop, you know, uh, that part of our brain that allows us to restrain uh, you know, fear and restrain reactivity and to, you know, empathize with others and all of that. You know, um, so, so, you know, that's the foundation. Um, you know, compassion then, uh, you know, stretches things a little bit further and gets us a little more uh, sort of proactively involved in the world. You know, and these different, what are called vehicles in the Buddhist tradition, in the Tibetan tradition, uh, of practice are seen as part of one gradual path. And historically, they evolved gradually as well, even though probably they were all present at, in the Buddha's day. He probably he gave very different teachings to different people. And some people got probably each of these different things. And, you know, um, that's my take anyway. And I think the Tibetans sort of feel that way. So you can think of the first 500 years of Buddhist history as uh, focused on the, the basic Buddhism and the basic peace-making uh, process. And then, you know, around the time of the New Testament in the West, in, in you know, in India, uh, you know, civilizations, societies were becoming more interested in educating uh, people broadly and in uh, developing a compassionate civilization, a compassionate nonviolent culture. And so uh, this new form of Buddhism uh, called the Mahayana, or the greater vehicle, some people say, or, you know, I, I call the universal or social vehicle. So, you know, the first one you can think of is the individual vehicle. It's the, th it's the vehicle that takes one person to enlightenment. The social vehicle takes a society to enlightenment, okay? And, and it's based, if the, if the individual vehicle is based on dispassion, the universal vehicle or social vehicle is based on compassion. Now, so that's only, that's 500 maybe to, you know, uh, uh, to, you know, from say 100 a AD to around, or CE or whatever you want to call it, to around five or 600, that became popular. And, um, you know, th th with it, the cults of bodhisattvas, that understanding that each of us could be a Buddha and has a, 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 a sort of a spiritual gene or an altruistic gene within us. 
And that that's really, and in a way, so the Buddha comes to life now in each of us, because it's been 500 years since the Buddha was around. And you're looking, okay, where are the new Buddhas, okay? And, and so there's sort of a sense in the community that, you know, each one of us has the potential and we need to develop it. And we all need to work together to transform the society. That's what the, what the Buddha was trying to do. Um, you get even then further at the at sort of 1500 or uh, I'm sorry at, at 500 or 600 and and you start to really uh, you know there starts to be even more of an emphasis I think you historically you're further and further away from the memory of the Buddha because initially the Buddha said don't you know don't think don't make cast don't make images of me don't appoint a successor rely on yourselves but after a while it gets kind of tiring so you know um, the emphasis in the in the the tantric process or the vajrayana, uh, what I call the process vehicle, that's you know uh, all about uh, uh, you know learning to from our teachers. Okay, so the focus then goes on really finding those people that are connected to this tradition of enlightenment, and you know focusing on their positive qualities and trying to use them to stimulate, catalyze one's own transformation in the same way that, say, psychotherapy works or childhood works, by intimate sort of role modeling bonds. And the visualization practice, I'll run you through, if we have time, uh, a brief visualization practice using the healing Buddha at the end. And it gives you a flavor for how the visualization is designed, not like the spirituality that I grew up with, which was to sort of worship you know, somebody else, but it's designed to sort of admire and see qualities that you want to emulate or incorporate and then to incorporate them into yourself and, and boost your sense of confidence or capacity. So the role modeling imagery is all about projecting our ideals onto our models and then having our models sort of project them on back onto ourselves so that we can really own them and live up to them in that kind of teamwork, that synergy that comes between you know, people working closely together to, to build qualities. So it's a very beautiful and powerful tradition that works very nicely and neatly with psychotherapy, for example, but I think it's also gonna work well with coaching and mentoring of all different kinds. Um, and, and it's fascinating because, you know, it's a way to sort, it's like an internet, really. It's a way to distribute the personal influence of good role models. Like, so if you were to get the initiation that the Dalai Lama gave you know, a year ago, you could, right now, you could go home and sit down and be meditating on the Dalai Lama right in, in your, you know, in your mind's eye and, and sort of reviving your sense of connection to him, your experience of him, and, and then, then imaginatively taking it into yourself and finding it within yourself and trying to cultivate it within yourself. And that practice is a way of you know, amplifying the teaching capacity of sort of cultivating mastery, transmitting it from generation to generation. So it's a very powerful practice of, you know, I would say spiritual leadership, but starting, of course, with leading ourselves, you know, and then maybe trying to make a difference, you know, uh, in, our, in our circles. So I call that the cultural vehicle, right? That that's the vehicle that uses images and symbols to, to uh, um, recreate ourselves to, uh, you know, it's related also to narrative therapy. Um, to the idea of, that we can sort of reinvent our, ourself and, and sort of a very American thing, right? We have an identity crisis, we sort of reinvent ourselves. This tradition does it, it, it raises it to an art and to a spiritual art in a very, very beautiful way that's somewhat related to alchemical, the kind of alchemical things that Jung was fascinated by. Uh, that's always interested me. Um, is that, was that, Somewhat clear. <laughs> so you'll get a little flavor for it. It's very different, right? I mean, it's not, that's not like sitting and peacefully watching your breath. <laughs> but it's, it's, you know, follows the same basic model of mind. And it really is assuming the same principles and practices, but using a different technology. And actually, I, I was meeting with a, a young Vipassana um, adept in New York at, at a book launch in New York. And he mentioned to me that in some of the some of the Pali scriptures about meditation, there's a little clause which is found in yoga tradition, but I'd never seen it in Buddhism. That one of the ways you can build concentration is by focusing on a, on an image 
of someone you admire of the Buddha or something like that. And so these techniques have been known in India for a long time, and they've been known to other traditions. The Jesuits do this. The Jesuits, you know, in, in the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, uh, visualize themselves as Christ going through the, the gospel narratives. So, so that's the same idea. It's, you know, they call it the imitation of Christ. Um, so it's the same idea that you, you know, and, and it, you know, it's the same way that an athlete now imagines themselves jumping over that high vault. If you do that, there's something in the power of imagery to prime the neural networks in our brain to prepare us to do a, to behave in a, in a new way. And that's why people have flight simulators. That's why astronauts and, and people, uh, you know, flying very big and dangerous vehicles, or big steamers or whatever, you know, first practice through these virtual uh, technology, and then they actually do it. So the idea here is in the third vehicle, we're sort of practicing. We're trying to get our mind, we're trying it on for size. I sometimes call it on-the-job training. Like, you know, like when I was training to be a doctor, they teach you a lot of stuff in medical school and which none of it is really relevant, right? And then they throw you on the floor. It has nothing to do with practicing medicine. They throw you on the floor. They put a white coat on you say, okay, okay, doctor, now what? Okay, and then you have to learn to practice medicine. And that's when the learning really begins when you sort of, you know, uh, you have to see yourself in that role as, you know, if I were president for a day, or if, I, or now I'm the doctor, I've been, there, I've been appointed the doctor. You know, uh, what do I really do? And so, uh, you know, that's a kind of simulation practice, right? It's getting our minds into the into the right groove. But then there's the actual practice of what they call refinement or perfection, and that's where where we're really trying to get the right energy and the right mind state. And here we kind of go back to where we started. In the fourth wheel, when we're practicing working with our subtle nervous system, the nervous system that you've seen in the yoga maps with the chakras and the three channels in the center and so on, you know, we're practicing, this is really a map of the nervous system done by contemplatives from the inside out. And I believe it, it interfaces closely with our own uh, gross anatomy map. Uh, but it, it's you know, sort of coming at it from the inside and, and, uh, and also coming at it for the purpose of one person living better in their nervous system or transforming the nervous system rather than, say, doing surgery on the brain or, or putting chemicals in the brain. So, uh, but in, the, in the, that fourth wheel, we're talking about doing what the alchemists and the mystics always talked about, which is tapping into that pure bliss energy, the, the sort of pure energy of if you want pure love or unconditional love or pure disarmament within us and, and learning how to run on that energy instead of running on our stress energy all the time. And, and you know, this is, of course, not so easy to do. But again, if the amazing thing about modern neuroscience and about what we're learning about the brain and its plasticity and its capacity for um, sort of self-regulation and social regulation, what we're learning is that, you know, in fact, we, you know, we do, our brains do have the capacity to, to run in completely different ways. And we can model that through, through focusing our attention and through practicing, uh, you know, states of mind and, and, and uh, patterns of action or patterns of response styles. So, um, so, the, so the perfection stage really has to do with, you know, becoming the kind of person that's just no longer what I call the traumatized sense of self. It's no longer anchored in the little traumas of life, the, the frightened child or the cornered animal energies within us, and has sort of cut the umbilical cord with those and fully committed to, what, to being what I call an obligate mammal. That is to being sort of totally you know, adapted to the total social, cultural life that we live by really dedicating ourselves to running on that pure energy of, of just pure, un unconditional love and, and pure bliss, blissful openness is what I call that energy. And we have it within us. We feel it now and then, but then we sort of go back to being freaked out <laughs> and stressed out. And we think that that's life. But, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know it doesn't have to be. And, and the amazing thing about the Buddhist tradition that many of you already know from doing you know, basic vipassana or loving kindness practice is that it offers systematic methods and it offers a, a sort of non-mysterious cause and effect 
explanations about how it works so that we can buy into each step, you know, a step at a time and have the courage to, to push our limits and move along and, and become the kind of people that we need to be, really, to, to be happy in this, in this crazy uh, world and, and try to, you know, uh, you know keep, keep the world uh, in one piece. So, yes, wonderful. I have, let, let me take a few more questions, then we'll try to do a brief visualization meditation to give you a flavor for that. And then, you know, if, I'll be in the back if anybody wants to uh, actually take sustainable happiness home uh, in book form. <laughs> I was wondering what, can you hear me? I what, can hear you, yes. Good, so. great. What role creativity and play have in this tradition? Oh, you know, I, I would say um, in my personal experience, of course, the happy person is always playful and creative, but, and lots of monks, you know, uh, and nuns are happy. Uh, in many different traditions, lots of people are happy. Um, but I do feel it's one of the things about the Tibetan tradition that they have, like, as I compare them to my... Uh, Catholic, I was raised Catholic, right? So, and I was taught by monks and nuns, okay? And, you know, some of them were really, really special, and I still remember them. I was just emailing one of them last night. And, and some of them were kind of like Sister Mary Elephant, whack, you know? <laughs> um, and, 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 of course, you look at the scandal with the sex abuse, right? This is all coming from people not having the methods to psychosexually and energetically mature. So they're not happy in their nervous system, and there's no way. Now, if you look at the, the Tibetans, you look at Tibetan monks, and you'll see that they generally tend to be much more playful people. And, and you look at the Dalai Lama, for example, you know, uh, you never know what to expect from him. He's, he can be a trickster, or suddenly he'll just cry out of the blue, you know, about something he remembered. Uh, and so there's a free-flowing person there, and I think that that's very much part of this sort of uh, the, the tantric approach not sort of working with our, our nature rather than trying to control it so much. Um, and so in a way, if you want to say, you know, in terms of the last two wheels that represent this new, more specifically Tibetan version of, of, of Buddhism, the third wheel is creativity. It's learning how to use your mind in a responsible way to become the kind of person that, you, that is going to be happy and is going to help others be happy. Okay, so, but it's all about imaginative recreation. And, this, and the fourth wheel is about play. It's learning how to let go of all the, the, the vestiges of, of fear energy, shame energy, uh, closed reactive energy and, and, and response, and tap into that free-flowing openness that's, that's a really comfortable, that we feel when we're really comfortable and creative. Okay, so thank you for that question. Yes. Um, in Mahayana tradition, talk about the simile of the bowl of water. There's a, in studying the hindrances, there's a wonderful simile of tranquility. Tell me, please. Uh, think of yourself as a bowl of clear, pure, still water. Yes, yes. Yeah. And then the, then the hindrances come up. Anger, yes. boiling water. Yes, yeah. It's beautiful, and definitely, like the Dalai Lama talks about the, uh, uh, he likes the metaphor of the ocean, and says, you know, on the waves, the, the surface, there's the waves, and at the bottom, it's still and, cl and clear, or, you know, still and, and peaceful anyway. Uh, if it's a clear ocean, it's clear, I guess. Uh, and he says, you know, uh, the purpose, the sort of, one of the aims we're trying to get at in practice is to be able to be, uh, have our awareness equally distributed throughout and to be both in that sort of, to be connected to the deep stillness while we're sort of working with, hopefully creatively, with the, the waves on the surface. But yeah, I mean, you know, all, all of this stuff is present in the, in the Pali Sutras. I mean, I, I, I ha, you know, found a, a sutra, the a sutra of the uh, Samana Fala Sutra, the Fruits of the Homeless Life, it's called, uh, in which uh, the Buddha teaches a practice for creating a mind-made body. He says, take out of your nervous system like an arrow from a sheath. Uh, take out uh, the energy to make, and make out of it a mind-made body. 
shaped just like the person you know you want to be, fully formed. So he taught that's teaching this self-creation practice. And it's right there in the Samana Fala Sutta. So I think all of these things he taught to different people. He didn't teach one dogma, he worked with people. And so somebody needed this and he gave them that, this, and somebody needed that, and they gave them that. It's like, you know, one of my psychiatry professors that I much admired, he said, you know. Joe, I believe in the Delhi theory of psychiatry. And says, somebody wants pastrami, give him pastrami. Okay, <laughs> you know, and, and but that's really you know the Buddha was was not coming from a place of this is what I have to teach you. He was coming from a place of how can I help you find your way to happiness. And and so I think uh, he came up with a lot of different teachings, and then different lineages preserved them and and extended them, and the Mahayana traditions, in my view, even the tantric traditions, the, the Vajra traditions, the traditions that we're talking about, probably go back way, you know, all the way to his day, in my, in my belief, in the Tibetan belief. So I think maybe we can take one more question, and then, and then we, we, we will have time for a brief meditation. In the four wheels that you've mentioned, um, they all seem to be individual-centric. I mean, the individual, the transformation of the individual seems to be the crucial uh, uh, linchpin in the, in the change process. That's not your vocabulary, but uh, I'm trying to get there. Uh, the question I have is whether there's a, a fifth wheel anywhere which is more uh, policy-oriented, more institutionalized. I mean, when you talk about the Catholic Church, I mean, clearly that's more than the transformation of the individual. I mean, there's, there's an organization there. There's a... There's a uh... Yes. So yes. I'm wondering if Buddhism also lends itself to an ideology with social policy uh, goals that can be uh, institutionalized in, in society as a way yes. of reaching the goals and values of, of sustainable happiness. Yes, no, they, they, they very much do in the second and the third vehicles especially, even though you're right that the, the, the point of leverage from which we act in this tradition is transforming ourselves. And so we're the laboratory and we're also the, the agent. We, we're, we're seeing ourselves, but, but we also recognize that we're totally interconnected with all of the living beings and, we, and we're selfless. So we're part of reality and we're part of society, and so we change, and things, other things change too. One person changes, other people change. One person changes, a society changes, a culture changes. You change your mind and a culture changes. And, and specifically in the second and the third vehicles, or well, this is true even in the beginning, basic Buddhist practice, and, and, and sort of, you know, Buddhism had a social philosophy from the very beginning. Uh, I mean, the Buddha was a, was a, a king. He ha and he, and he uh, you know, he created his, his institution as a democracy in a very, you know, countercultural and interesting way. Um, but, you know, um, the uh, second vehicle, specifically in the work of Nagarjuna, if you look at what's called the, the precious garland of advice to the king, okay, uh, where the Nagarjuna, uh, who was the founder of the second vehicle, um, you know, gave his uh, advice to one of the king's ministers. He was a minister to a king. And so he gave his advice to one of the kings of S South India at that time and talked about social policy. What do you do with prisons? What do you do with spies? What do you do with, you know, uh, poor people and housing? And he talked about all these things in a total compassionate, uh, but also a radically transformative way. The, the third vehicle is, I would say, even more interestingly uh, transformative. And, and if you look at the at that part of the book, you'll see that it isn't just about transforming yourself, but when you transform yourself, like in the, in the Wheel of Time practice, you, you aren't just alone. You have a community, you have a family of you know, 762 other people. You have a staff, okay? And that staff that has a, has a hierarchy of some kind, and everybody works together and tunes into the same energy, and, and you're modeling leadership because you're not just modeling how you lead your own nervous system, you're, you're modeling how you interact with others who have uh, a nervous system. And, and you know, these practices are even meditated in teams. 
sometimes to generate sort of a team energy or a group energy. So I talk about in that context, the building not just a creative, part of being a creative altruist is building a community of altruists. If you don't build a community of altruists, you haven't succeeded in becoming a, 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 an enlightened altruist, okay? So, so it's definitely part of it, okay? So um, let's, let's do a brief medicine Buddha meditation, okay? All right, so do try to envision yourself once again in your lighter, clear, meditative body. Take some nice deep breaths and try to refresh your breath energy, get back in balance and try to let all the words and thoughts float out for now and just tune into your living, breathing body. Try and tune into your, your lighter, clearer spectrum, your breath body. And if you want to sort of envision you know, the universe in a way that might, that helps the creative process, you can re reflect that, you know, the very way that our map of the world, the way we perceive the world is actually a, a virtual reality that we've pr projected onto the world as it is, to the quantum soup of things. So imagine just right now calling back that projection. Imagine your map of the universe melting into your map of the galaxy and your map of the galaxy into your map of the solar system, and your map of the solar system into your map of the planet, your map of the planet into your map of this space, your map of this space into the, your map of your body, and your map of your body into the pure energy and awareness that is the creative uh, mind energy and uh, the creative mind space and neural energy that, that supports your, your map making. So then feel that you've sort of suddenly melted into a sea of pure energy and awareness and that that's really the natural state of things outside and within us. And with that pure sea, try, let's try to look for a pure, you know, a sort of a, a, a safe and, and positive direction to cultivate that, that pure workspace of mind and, and uh, to sort of help us build a way of being in the world that works for ourselves and others. So ask for the guidance you need from the universe and imagine a thrill to be asked. The universe responds by emanating the pure energy form of the, of the Buddha, of the healing medicine Buddha. Uh, and that's uh, sort of like a moonlight disk of energy, like luminous, moon white, pure uh, cleansing energy that that's, comes before you and it's like a reflection of a moon in water, just glimmering. But it's it's not just a thing. It, there's a the person, the spirit, the mind of the of, of enlightenment of the Buddha's enlightenment is there. It's the energy of his enlightenment, and you're feeling it as sort of pure medicine, the elixir of immortality. He called it, and you're breathing it in, and it's soothing your afflictions. But you want more personal guidance, more more sort of specific uh, direction. And so asking for that, you know, imagine he reads your mind and bubbling up on that sun disk, there's an exclamation point of sapphire light. And that exclamation point is his affirmative speech, symbolizes his affirmative speech beaming and permeating and sort of sending out um, healing energy and intuition, uh, symbolized by a rainbow aura, and also sending out the uh, positive a message or affirmative message, we, we all, we all, may we all heal and be healed. So as you're taking that in, your own mind space and your own inner voice is resonating with that affirmative voice and you're starting to feel a little more hopeful and yet you still want more uh, personal, intimate guidance. And so reading your mind, the universe uh, emanates from the moon disk and exclamation point from the aura surrounding them emanates the body of the medicine Buddha, which is made of sapphire uh, or lapis lazuli blue light. And so he's sort of this deep midnight blue uh, peaceful light, but beaming, for, it's translucent in nature and beaming uh, from within, from his heart where the moon disk and the a sapphire syllable or beaming rainbow lights. And so he has an aura that's a rainbow aura. He has the, uh, the robes of a monk 
Um, he, in his right hand, is over his right knee. Uh, he's seated in meditation, and over his right hand, over his right knee, is holding a sprig of medicinal aloe, symbolizing the uh, wisdom and science to master the healing uh, power of the earth and of all uh, plants and things, and to heal the body. And then sitting on his left hand on his lap is a bowl, a begging bowl filled with an elixir, which represents the, the, uh, you know, the pure meditative elixir or neural energy and chemistry of, of blissful openness. That's the inner medicine that heals the mind and the nervous system. Okay, and so there he is, sort of brimming with these things, s smiling at you with, uh, with love and care, like, a, like an, uh, your only uh, parent, uh, dear teacher, dear guide. And, and any, please do think of any m role model in your life who, who uh, uh, symbolizes for you or, or uh, you know, represents for you uh, the, the great vitality of being um, healthy, a mind and body outlook uh, and energy, and and ask the spirit of that person, not the image, but the but the inner spirit or energy of that, the qualities of that person, to enter the vision you have of the medicine Buddha, of the healing Buddha, uh, and and then go through the, what what's called the bonding process of sort of admiring the qualities and not passively, but I want those qualities. They're they're terrific, and then you know, offering yourself as raw material, what I wouldn't give to have those qualities in my life, in my own mind and body. And then, you know, letting go of any, disclosing and letting go of any sense of limitation or inadequacy. I'm just not good enough. I did this. I, I can't do that. Um, and seeing that the Buddha sees through those limits and sees your inner potential, your inner Buddhahood uh, sort of moving right through them. And then you feel this deeper sense of identity or vicarious enjoyment uh, you know, a playful enjoyment of his qualities. They're so wonderful. Maybe I could do that. And then, um, you know, you then ask for the help you need to embody those qualities. And, and thrilled to be asked from his heart, he beams all the healing energy in the universe from his heart, uh, from the seed syllable of the exclamation point into your heart. And it beams into you like a rainbow wave filling you melting away illnesses, doubts, fears, limitations, and filling you from within, from your heart, um, like a, with uh, the nectar of healing energy and awareness, uh, just as a flame would fill a lamp or a nectar would fill a vase. <clears throat> so you're sort of overflowing from within with this positive energy. Your, your mind energy, your subtle mind has become a moon disk of pure, of, of pure open-mindedness, and your inner voice has become a... a an exclamation point of positive speech and affirmative thought. And you know, you're filled with this rainbow energy, and so it's transforming your sense of your body so that you appear to yourself as the, as the medicine Buddha, the healing Buddha of, made of, of lapis light. And there's an aura around you of all the positive energy and awareness that you're, that you're tapping into. And it ripples out through all your intentions and actions in the world through the city, country, and planet, um, making a difference in everybody's life so that the world sort of feels it and feels a sense of vicarious gratitude and solidarity. And so from the ends of the earth, that, that sense that comes back in the form of a wave of solidarity back into this space, back into your heart, then reflecting that even though you have this taste of the medicine Buddha in this moment, that it's just a simulation right now, and not the real thing, and you, you want the Buddha to, to guide you and inspire you um, and your development until you become like that. Uh, imagine he melts into a drop of rainbow light, which is the essence of his moon disk and uh, exclamation. And that drop filled with all of the healing energy and awareness uh, of his being, of his essence, comes into your crown and slips into your crown, throat, and heart, merging inseparably with your own inner healer, your own inner uh, healing Buddha. And as it does, you sort of once again feel uh, sort of tapped into a sense of identity with, the, with your full potential, and it fills you as a flame would a lamp or a nectar a vase, and once again ripples out in all your intentions and actions so that the whole world around, every, everyone in the city, country, and planet themselves also transforms into, into the form of a healing Buddha. And 
so the universe becomes a pure land, that our earth becomes a pure land, and this positive energy of gratitude and validation comes back from the ends of the earth, rippling back through all the hearts and minds, back into this space, into your heart. So the world returns to its normal appearance, the space and your body return to their normal appearance, but at your heart, there's the essence of the healing Buddha. And so commit into that essence, whatever uh, insight or energy you've developed in the course of our discussion and meditation together uh, for your own, you know, until you become a healing Buddha for your own benefit and for the benefit of the world around you. <laughs>